it's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. Did you appreciate that as a kid? I don't think I wore a shirt <laughs> other than at private school until I moved out of Miami. Tony DeCopel still has a soft spot for Miami. It's where he grew up in the 1980s, back when it really was Paradise Lost. Those were the days when it seemed Miami was all drug wars and police raids. An image fortified by a TV show about two cops who sped around town in a black convertible. By 1984, when Miami Vice debuted, everything you were seeing on screen was myth and gorgeous, but also reality. And people in Miami were very happy to watch themselves and their life reflected in an almost documentary way. But that wasn't his life. Tony DeCopel's corner of Miami was insulated and quite comfortable, thanks to his very successful father. If you smoked Columbia marijuana in the 70s or 80s, I owe you a thank you card. Why do you say that? Because you bought my father's product, and you bought my baseball gloves by extension, and you put me through private school, and you paid for the boat that we crisscrossed the ocean with, and the Caribbean vacations, and the good life. Of course, as a kid, Tony had no clue where it all came from. What did you think he did for a living? When I was old enough to ask questions, I, I was told that he sold real estate in Vermont and that he developed property. Was that true? It was true. Just wasn't the whole sort story. Of, yeah. That real estate job seemed to allow him a lot of free time, and he doted on his son and made him feel adored. It was idyllic until it ended. When Tony Jr. was six, his father abruptly walked away from him and his mother. To see him go was a, a surprise and quite the stab in the heart. And the stab felt like it got deeper as the years went on. And so did the mystery. Dad would reappear sporadically, but never for long. Word was he became a drug addict and lost everything. The younger DeCopel went on to finish college and get a job as a journalist. He started looking for his dad and picked up a paper trail that led to the National Archives in Boston, where he found this, an indictment charging one Anthony DeCopel of drug trafficking on a massive scale. What did you think when you found that indictment? You've never met someone so happy to discover that their father was a class one felon because... Happy? Happy because it, it showed a degree of high level accomplishment. This was not an easy thing. Uh, 17 tons of bulky, smelly plant matter. It's like smuggling 17 elephants in the country. And to pull that off, I thought, huh, maybe he had something going on. Turns out his operation was nearly foolproof. So what my father and his partners did was go to Columbia with a big freighter, which you can put tons on, and then have that freighter meet sailboats in the Caribbean. And those smaller boats would parcel out the load and sail north of the Canadian border turn around, then head south along the coast to make their deliveries, because southbound boats were seldom suspected of drug smuggling. They never got caught, not once. Marijuana dealers of the 70s and 80s saw themselves as folkloric heroes uh, who weren't going to get involved in that soul-killing cocaine. They weren't going to spread that around the country. They were going to spread peace and love and expansion of the mind, creativity. They were doing good as far as they saw. They were flouting a silly prohibition. In fact, Tony Jr. writes in his new memoir, the smuggler's life was so appealing, his dad ultimately chose it over his own family. Was your dad a hero? Uh, yeah, you know, he was a hero to the 40 million Americans who relied on him to bring in a, a product. Was he a hero to me? We played wiffle ball and went swimming and had a good time, but in retrospect, he could have been a little more heroic as a father. How so? Could have stuck around. Big Tony's big life changed six years after his last job, when a snitch turned him in. In the years before he went to jail, he'd set up the pot dealer's version of a trust fund, burying huge amounts of cash in styrofoam coolers. He put 500000 in a mountainside in New Mexico, and he put 100000 next to the wood pile in Long Island, where one of my relatives lived, and another 100000 in a different location on that site. The family found some but most of Big Tony's money just seemed to disappear. He doesn't know, he cannot account for all of it at the end. Could some still be buried somewhere? I have looked through those woods. <laughs> I, I would really too. Really he had better luck finding his long lost dad. 
The elder de Copel, now 67, lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and has, he says, less than $1,000 to his name. Under $1,000? Yeah. From the man who made how much? You must have done the numbers, Tony. Three, three million, maybe four, five million. Most of it, he says, went to feed his addictions to drugs and women. <laughs> it was just fun. I mean, I love women. I love to be around them, but I never get a chance to do that. So I'm estranged from them. In the present, but you had a nice run. Oh, my, oh, my. His only regret, it seems, is walking away from his little boy. I'll always know exactly how Tony looked that night when I left. Oh. But if you could do it all again, would you? Yes. No doubt about it. Ex unless I would have to leave Tony again. If I could do it all again and keep Tony, then I would have done it. I would have done it in a second. I have a bunch of pictures, and oh. you and you can print them out. At, the, at a photo shop. Father and son yeah, came shop. together for our interview. Else, uh, but Chinese, for Tony Jr., himself the father of two, there's still a lot of hurt to work yeah, through. That's, good. Well, that's what you want, right? That's exactly what I love. What's your relationship like now? I want it to be good, but it's not. It's not good because I can't look at him without scratching my head. It still is hard for me to understand how I could be confident going forward in the world having come from him. You know, race car drivers don't watch crashes. And my father's a crash. <laughs> and I don't want to be confronted with it. Yet at the same time, you're the one who took this on. You're the one who took it full on, did a, wrote a book. I took it full on, and I looked for the answer that I could live with, and I think I found it, which is he chose his life, and I can choose mine. He had the talents that he was born with, and he used them for the ends that he saw fit and he loved it, and I can do the same. Maybe genes aren't destiny, and you need not accept a future that seems written in the family name. De Copel, in Czech, means I bought it all.